Why don't we get on to the fiction itself? And let's start with, well, at the very beginning with Strangers on a Train from 1950, which was adapted just a year later by none other than Alfred Hitchcock. Now, let's say that, that you'd like to get rid of your wife. It's a morbid thought. No, 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 no. Just suppose. Let's say that you had a very good reason. No, let's, let's, no, no, let's, let's, let's say that you'd be afraid to kill her. You know why? You'd get caught. And what would trip you up? The motive. Ah, oh, now here's my idea. I'm afraid I haven't got time to listen, Bruce. Listen, it's so simple, too. Two fellows meet accidentally, like you and me. No connection between them at all. Never saw each other before. Each one has somebody that he'd like to get rid of. So, they swap murders. Swap murders? <laughs> Each fellow does the other fellow's murder. Then there's nothing to connect them. Each one has murdered a total stranger. Like, you do my murder, I do yours. We're coming into my station. Mm. Bruno and Guy meeting on a train in the Hitchcock adaptation of Strangers on a Train. Um, I love that film. The book is different, though, Michael. Yeah, no, the book is very different. I mean, I think it's um, it's quite an astonishing start to a career. And even though I think Tricia Highsmith was, I think she was paid a flat fee of $6,000 for to sell the film rights and she was quite aggrieved by the fact that this film went on to be so iconic and she didn't sort of earn any more than the $6,000 she was originally paid. But I think it was... Um, it actually established her. I mean, it was an astonishing way for a young writer. She was still basically, I think, still in her 20s when the book was published. An astonishing start to uh, a career to have a, a director of Hitchcock's sort of calibre turn your first novel into such a successful film. And it's an idea, that idea of swapping murders that's been used so often since then. I mean, even in a comedy like Throw Mama from the Train, which was the Danny DeVito comedy, that that was based on that whole idea of swapping murders, you know, uh, which is a brilliant, brilliant sort of concept to, to, to launch a career on. <laughs> it's a pretty deceptively simple concept. Two strangers with no apparent motive commit these murders and it's all done away with, but it's never that easy, is it, Kate? It's never that easy. And one of the interesting things that shifted in the film, I guess, is who does get away with it and what happens to the the how many murders are committed in the end because there are two murders in the book and I think there's only one murder in the film. That's right, yeah. Joanna Murray-Smith, how good is this one plot-wise? Oh, well, it's the ultimate. I mean, I don't think there'd be a writer alive that didn't wish that they'd had the idea for Strangers on a Train before Patricia Highsmith did because those ideas that really sing as uh, any property, whether it's theatrical or cinematic or um, prose, are ones which are fundamentally symmetrical and simple. Uh, there's something about the symmetry of the idea that is completely and utterly persuasive and exciting, I think. It's a sexy idea. And also that idea of corruption, I think, that one, uh, that there are two characters, one of whom is more corrupt than the other, but whose, whose moral culpability is infectious. And the way in which uh, Bruno drags Guy into the darker side of his uh, psyche is also a completely mesmerising plot device, I think, as we see someone who we may identify with in the beginning as being like us, as kind of um, morally normal or conventional, gradually give way to their deeper impulses. And I think Joan Schenker, who wrote the brilliant biography of Highsmith, said that the story attacks its readers right where they live. And I think that's really true. I think that it's that um, what she establishes there as a 29-year-old writer is that we can all identify with the protagonists who find that their own moral um, boundaries shaking and eventually disappearing to, to sort of unleash their darker, wilder, uninhibited, sadistic impulses. Mm. What about you, Michael? I mean, how do you see this story? I, th I think it's, um, you know, very much 
you know, it's a product of, of this idea that, you know, we're all capable of murder, which is something P.D. James used to always maintain, the wonderful British writer P.D. James, who said we're all capable of murder, you know, in the right circumstances, and this is what Patricia Highsmith tapped into so brilliantly in Strangers on a Train, that, you know, morally we can all be compromised if the right buttons are pushed. And also because it's what makes it so intriguing as well is that, you know, it, it has to be murder because murder is the only crime you cannot make recompense for. You know, it's it's just, it's so final. And I think uh, all of those things she she plays quite brilliantly here in terms of creating that every man who is suddenly drawn slowly by a more manipulative individual, drawn into this web where they become trapped mm-hmm. and have to t- desperately try to find a way out. But you touched on the relationship between Guy and Bruno. Bruno's, well, he's Iago, he's you know, Machiavelli, he's, you know, he's classic. He's very much the Patricia Highsmith sort of character because, you know, she goes back to characters like that time and time again in the novels. You know, Tom Ripley is that character as well. You know, although he would always argue, Ripley, that he would only, even though he's called a serial killer, he only kills when it's necessary. And that's what Patricia Highsmith used to argue as well with Ripley. And I think Bruno, um, Bruno, I think, is more psychopathic than that. You know, he's a greater sociopath, I think, than what Ripley, Ripley turns out to be. But how extraordinary that this is what she's done in her first published novel. And one of our predecessors here on Radio National, the broadcaster and writer Robert Desay, who presented books and writing. Now, what he argues about Patricia Highsmith's work is that it's like a parody of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment in that it's crime and no punishment. And he clearly knew her, knows her work very well. And he managed to record an interview with Highsmith in 1992, and it was not easy. He went to Switzerland. She uh, sort of agreed she'd do an interview, but she wasn't sure. So she said he just had to turn up in the town square and um, she'd have a look at him and decide whether she was going to do the interview. So there's this sense of her hiding behind lampposts and trees and peering out to look at him. Eventually, she did let him come. He made the cut. He made the cut. But listening to it, it was a very difficult interview for him because she was so elusive. He asked these fantastically penetrating questions and she'd go, oh, no, I don't know, I don't really think so. So it was a very difficult interview for him. But she did have this to say about Strangers on a Train. Even Strangers on a Train, my first book was uh, classified as a Harper novel of suspense. It sounded rather intriguing back in those days. When I first saw it on the cover, it was news to me. And then as the years went on, I found that um, the publishers had created a, a line of books, not only mine, called Suspense. Fine, but it does categorize you and so that you cannot jump from that exactly to a book like um, Carol, for instance, or uh, much later, uh, Edith's Diary, which is... Um, a novel about a, an American woman uh, whose life goes slowly, she's a married woman with one son, her life goes slowly downhill. There's no, uh, to call it lacking in suspense is ridiculous because I always thought suspense is integral in every story. That voice, Joanna Murray smith had you listened to many interviews with her as you were creating her voice for the stage? Yes, I did, I did. But, of course, once you're kind of embedded in your own work of imagination, you have to put aside all fact. Uh, so I trusted that I, was, I had inhabited her in a kind of uh, believable and truthful way through all my reading and listening and then I had to sort of abandon it and just go with what I had retained and allow my imagination to, to sort of roll with it. But, I mean, I think that it's kind of fascinating what she says because she was the, she, she was the master of suspense and, of course, suspense. Everybody who writes, in, who, who engages in any kind of storytelling, really in any form, understands the notion of suspense because it's it's about a connection an emotional connection with the receiver of the work um, and without that emotional connection you can't really succeed I think as an artist 
But, you know, what's sort of fascinating, I think, listening to her like that, talking about herself, is how sort of well-mannered she is and sort of moderate she sounds. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated when I watch her in interviews. There's one interview she did, I think, in the 70s with a panorama or an English uh, woman, female interviewer, where she's sort of positively intimidated by the interviewer's class And I've always sort of felt that in as much as people talk about Highsmith being obsessed with certain things, and she certainly is obsessed with um, transformation and and, uh, the transcending of who you are to become someone else and those sort of things, she's also absolutely fascinated by class and that plays, I think, a lot into her adulation of Ripley and his character and her own sense of, you know, in Ripley when you get that sense of of the sort of desire for him to be Dickie Greenleaf and to absorb Dickie Greenleaf's life, it, it's about making up for things which your own life and your own biography lacked. And I think that Highsmith did that really. She She invested in her characters in a way that she wanted them to reconceive her and make up for her own lacking in terms of her own biography and her own childhood. She admired what she wasn't and she wanted to repair that. She admired what she wasn't. Perhaps that's the um, that's the subtitle for the for the program today. 